I'm Krista McCracken, and I'm going to start today off by talking a little bit about place. I want to acknowledge that I'm living and working on Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, the traditional homelands of the Anishinaabe and Metis people, specifically the communities of Garden River First Nation, Batchawana First Nation, and the historic Metis community of Sault Ste. Marie. And I really want to acknowledge that I'm here speaking as a settler and that the knowledge that I'm sharing today comes from my perspective and is really informed by decades of work of residential school survivors and Indigenous community members. And as kind of a last note, I am going to be talking about the history of residential schools and showing a select number of photos related to residential schools and just really recognizing that this history can be difficult to talk about for some folks and that if you need to take the time to care for yourself or step away, I completely understand and just would encourage you to reach out and talk with somebody and practice those good self-care techniques. So as I said, I wanted to start by talking about place. So I work at Algoma University. It is one of the only universities in Canada that's located in a former residential school. On the slide here, you can see two images. The black and white image is what the original Shenghua home looked like. It opened in 1874 to about 50 students. And that building operated until about 1935 when they built new Shenghua Hall. And that's the color photo on this slide. That building operated as a residential school until 1970, with Algoma University moving into that space in 1971. And so thinking about the long history on this site and the need as, you know, an educational institution to talk about this history, to teach about it, to preserve it, a lot of that work wasn't done right away. If you had have talked to a faculty member, to someone who worked at Algoma University in the 1970s and asked them, oh, this is a really old building. What was it before it was a university? No one would have said it was a residential school. It really wasn't until local survivors, local First Nation members came together that the importance and the history of this place kind of came to the forefront. In 1981, the first Children of Shingwalk Alumni Association gathering was held on the site, and it was organized really as a school reunion. So inviting folks to come together, begin to talk about their experiences of residential school, and connect with other people who attended the school. And so this is in the 80s. They weren't really sure how many people would want to come back to the residential school. They thought, oh, maybe we'll get 50 people. Over the course of the weekend, they had over 300 people show up because there really was this interest to start to create community and to begin to talk about what happened in residential schools. This is super significant that this was happening in 1981 because nationally, there's still residential schools open at this point. It also wasn't until the mid-90s, late 90s, that people started to talk about the harms that happened at residential schools. So out of that first reunion, though, there was a lot of video recordings, audio recordings of survivors talking about their experiences. There was also people who showed up with documents, photos, and things they wanted to be able to share with community. And that's really where a lot of my work comes in. It's about sharing and teaching about the history of residential school. And so my work is pretty grounded in the Shingwalk Residential School site, but also thinking about how the legacy of that site reaches all across the land. So this map here shows many of the home communities that students traveled from to come to Sault Ste. Marie. So Sault Ste. Marie is here, but you can see that, you know, students traveled from as far south as Sarnia, Wapole Island, as far north as the James Bay Coast in northern Quebec. There was also some students from out east, out west, the United States, and uh, the Northwest Territories. So when I'm talking about this history, 
it really impacts more than just the local Sault Ste. Marie community. And teaching about it, you know, at the post-secondary level is something that extends just beyond Algoma University. It's a really unique site that has a history that can kind of be expanded and shared right across the land. So one of the things that the Shingwak Residential School Center and Algoma University have been doing in the past few years is thinking about how we can shift place-based learning to an online forum. Since the 90s, the center that I work in has been doing in-person site tours of the Shingwak site. And so it walks you through the building that once was a residential school. It also involves exploring the grounds that include a cemetery, a chapel, and a number of other monuments and markers related to the residential school. And talking to students on the site of a former residential school can really be an experience that is transformative and helps create those personal connections to the past. But how do you do that in an online space without physically being there? And also, how do you manage the emotions that might come up while learning about this history? Talking about residential schools and what happened there can be difficult. And as educators, instructors, we want to make sure that we're caring for our students and for our community as well. Part of the work that we've done has been looking at how to move this content online and really framing it around a desire to center survivor voices, center individual stories. And so the image here is of the front doors to what is now Algoma University, which was the Shingwak Residential School. You can see a historical photo as well as a contemporary photo. And we've shared this content online in both webinar format as part of an ebook and as part of a virtual tour. But beyond just sharing the images, we're really talking about individual experiences with those spaces. So these doors, for many students, when they walked through them, their lives changed forever. Uh, one of the survivors we work really closely with, uh, his name's Mike Kakaji. When he entered the residential school for the first time, it was the first time he saw electric lights, uh, he also remembers there being a really strong hospital smell. And so when we're talking about these doors and sharing photos of them online, really connecting them to the individual experience has been something that we forefronted in building empathy in students. But also being able to connect it to what are your experiences like when you enter into university for the first time, when you enter onto campus today. And what does it feel like when you're exploring this history? What does it make you think of today? So really inquiry-based learning paired with uh, that survivor narrative and that individual narrative. So like I was saying, forefronting those personal experiences. Uh, so kind of another example of that that we have shared online is Fran Fletcher Luther attended a couple residential schools in Ontario, uh, the Shingwak Residential School, as well as uh, the residential school that was in Chaplow, Ontario. When she was in residential school, she spent a lot of time in the sewing room. And she later, when she left residential school, she bought a sewing machine and did a lot of sewing for her own family and in her community, as well as selling some of her sewing. It's so actually the sewing machine that you're seeing on the screen was hers. And so talking about transformative narratives, I think is another piece that is really critical when we're talking about residential schools. The survivors that I work with are some of the most amazing human beings, some of the most resilient human beings that I've ever met. And so wanting to make sure that that part of the history is being told, I think is really important. And so thinking about ways that we can share this content online. So as those kind of two examples might show, we use photographs a lot. We also use video quite a lot to kind of bring survivors into the classroom. 
Uh, we've also created a couple press books that are a combination of both video, audio clips, and narrative text that teaches about the Shingwok site in depth. And our current project is actually a virtual site tour. And this effort is really a way to bring people to Sault Ste. Marie who can't physically come here as a way to teach about the history of residential schools in an immersive way when folks you know, can't travel, but still are interested in learning. Um, so you can see, you know, this is the exterior of what is Algoma University today. Those are those front doors that I was talking about. If we pull up the map, you can see what the original Shingwok site looked like. And we can kind of explore that with students through guided conversations, so kind of like I'm doing here. So over a video call, we can walk them through the steps, but they can also explore at their own pace, which I think is really important for this type of content, uh, particularly recognizing that folks learn in different ways, uh, but also depending on personal experiences, learning about this topic can be uh, more challenging than some other topics. Um, so I'm just gonna show a couple examples of the site itself. So this is actually the historic chapel. Um, and this is one of the sections of the virtual tour that's kind of still under development in that we haven't overlaid all the informational text yet and the archival photos. Uh, but this space is one of the most powerful spaces uh, when you're physically in it. So the chapel was built in 1883 and it was built almost entirely by the students of the Shingwak home. So all the woodwork that you're seeing in this photograph and that includes like the really intricate work up on the ceiling, um, as well as all the pews. Those were all created primarily by boys between the ages of 10 and 16. And hearing, you know, survivors talk about their experiences in this space, their memories of this space, and physically seeing this structure that has lasted since the 1800s is just so powerful. And I think it's a really important tool in teaching about the history of residential schools. Just take a step back and look at the exterior of the chapel as well, just to kind of give you some perspective. Um, and if you turn, like that's the university right up here. There's a tree blocking, but you kind of get the idea. Um, and so I think one of the important things about thinking about the virtual tour and how it came together is really wanting to combine survivor voices, learning opportunities, and the potential of technology in the classroom. And I would say that this project has definitely been a bit of a learning curve. Uh, we're about a, a year and a half into it, and it's still ongoing. Uh, part of it is because we are approaching this as very much a community-oriented project. You know, as I started off, uh, this isn't entirely my story to share. It is the story of generations of folks who have family who attended this residential school. And so wanting to share content online that is respectful, that is acknowledging the past, but is also educational, I think is a really important balance that we're trying to hit. Likewise, really thinking about not wanting to overwhelm users with content. So I work in an archive that has spent, you know, over 40 years collecting material about this residential school as well as many others. How do you condense that down? I mean, when we're in person, we do tours that are from 30 minutes in length to an hour in length, but recognizing that you know, the chances of somebody sitting at their computer to do a virtual tour for 30 minutes is very slim, or an hour for that matter. 
So thinking about ways that, you know, you can do little sound bites of survivors talking and that being in the video, or building out specific activities that can be used in the classroom, I think are really important examples that how putting this content online can be adapted. Um, and I'm definitely happy if folks have questions, you can always send me an email. And this project is still ongoing and we're still, you know, creating and tweaking. And it's something that I'm really looking forward to sharing with the broader community going forward. Thank you.